we went through the Sermon on the Mount, and it took us, I don't know how many months to, to go through the Sermon on the Mount, the whole thing, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And we characterize the Sermon on the Mount as a radical deconstruction of everything that we think we know, as an absolute prerequisite for being able to follow Jesus' way, to be able to apprehend, to experience kingdom before that is even possible for us. There is this transformation, this transition that needs to take place that involves just about everything that we think we know and everything that we experience. Our worldview has to change because kingdom is a worldview change. It's a complete and utter fundamental shift of everything. So in order to experience that, we have to go through this transformation. And this is what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. So since then, in the last few weeks since we finished that study, we have been breaking down what that deconstruction looks like for us here as modern Westerners. Okay, because Jesus broke it down in his way for the people of his culture and his time. And so in Matthew 5, he's breaking down and deconstructing their idea of law. Law was everything to ancient Jews, but he is going to redefine it, and he's going to put it into a, a different frame, not just about following the code, but actually fulfilling the intent of the code, bringing it inside so that's not just an outside compliance, but an actual inward transformation. And then Matthew 6, he takes on the code of righteousness, which is very well codified in ancient Jewish life. They had three things that they were measuring against their righteousness, giving alms and prayer and fasting. And he's going to take that and do the same thing with it. Bring it inside. Take it someplace where nobody sees. Make it your own personal connection with God rather than anything external. And then in chapter 7, he goes into deconstructing judgment. That is the result of following these codes so closely to think that we are right and everyone else is wrong and to judge them on that basis, to break that down so that we can start to see each and every one of us on an equal playing field with God and actually able to love the enemy, the person who comes from a different camp. So this is the way Jesus broke it down for his people. For us, we need to take it in a different way. We need to be able to understand what are the codes and what are the mindset that we are most struggling with or put better, what are the codes and the mindset that we're not struggling with? Because they are so deeply assumed in our worldview that we don't even think it's a worldview. It's just the ground that we walk on. It's just reality as we see it. How are we going to be able to break that down? And so we started a few weeks ago with taking a look at this obsession that we have with accomplishment, with performance, with being able to build somebody, build somebody, be a contender, you know? This idea that there is this contractual relationship that we have with God, this contractual mindset, that somehow we can earn ourselves, approve ourselves worthy to God. You know? And this is often not conscious. It's not something that we're thinking about. Again, this is so deeply assumed, so deeply a part of our unconscious core beliefs that we don't even realize that they are there. But this idea that if we do everything just the right way, if we perform just the right way, we're actually able to obligate God to do his end of the deal, to save us, to take us into kingdom, take us into heaven, whatever it is we, th we think we understand about this relationship that we have with God, but built on accomplishment, built on performance. One Sunday we talked about our Ecclesiastes moment, that moment where we have that ego-shattering epiphany that all these accomplishments, everything that we do outward, no matter what we build, is vanity. It's worthless. It's meaningless. It's striving after the wind. Just as Solomon understood at the end of his life with everything that he had amassed and everything that he had accomplished, that it didn't mean anything, that death came to everybody equally. The wise man, the fool, the rich, the poor, didn't matter. And in the final analysis, what he realizes is all we can really do and all that we need to do to fulfill our purpose is to enjoy our food, enjoy our drink, enjoy our work under the sun that we do, to enjoy our spouses and our families. In other words, that the present moment is all that there is. 
The present moment contains everything. And if we are there, even doing the things that seem so insignificant, we are doing that which has meaning and that which has purpose because of the rest of it. It just doesn't compute. It doesn't matter. True meaning, true purpose, and eventually true identity, who we know ourselves to be, lies deeper. And we'll find it only in this presence that we've been talking about all morning, this moment to enjoy this moment for what it is, not leading to someplace else, but just here, fully contained. So does that mean that there's nothing for us to do as we're trying to follow Jesus? No, that's not the case either. There is something to do, but it has a different flavor. It has a whole different context to it because this doing that Jesus would have us to do is not about accomplishment as acquisition not accomplishing something to acquire. That would be more striving after the wind. Jesus' way is not a way to heaven. Jesus' way is not a way to approval. Jesus' way is not a way to anything that stands outside of ourselves. Jesus' way is a way to experience what's already here, what's already now. Not to acquire something, but to strip away anything that would obscure this truth. That God has already gifted us with everything that we need. To strip away anything that would obscure our true selves, which are not based in the thoughts in our head, which are not based in the accomplishments we achieve or the roles that we play or anything else that we can create externally to ourselves. This is what Jesus' way is doing not acquiring something, not adding something, but subtracting something that has been accrued around who we were born to be. I like to use the analogy of uh, Michelangelo. And when he was given a commission for a sculpture, he would get the block of whatever it was, limestone, marble, and he'd walk around it, and he'd envision the finished sculpture inside the block as if it were frozen in ice. And when he could see it all in the finest detail, down to every last vein and muscle and hair, then he said all that was left to do was remove everything that wasn't the horse, remove everything that wasn't whatever it was that he was going to sculpt. That really describes what it is that we're doing in our spiritual formation. This perfect you, this kingdom person that you really are is already standing inside you as if frozen in a block of ice. And our spiritual journey is about removing everything that's not you, everything that has been added to because of fears, because of traumas, because of our experience in life, because of the way that life has taught us in all of its ways. So it's about subtraction. It's not about addition. The doing of Jesus' way will take everything that we have to give. But it's not about acquisition. And see, this is the big difficulty for us to take this idea and turn it around 180 degrees. But if you really analyze Jesus' teaching, this is exactly what he's doing every step of the way. Now, if we're serious about following Jesus, if we really want to do this, there are two major roadblocks that we talked about that we're going to have to overcome. And the first one is our mind, and the second one is our body. And why is that? Because the mind is the storehouse it's the repository for our egoic consciousness and the duality of our egoic consciousness. Our mind thinks dualistically. It always is separating things. This from that, right from wrong, light from dark, advantageous to disadvantageous. And that's the way that we survive. Our minds are designed to work that way so that we can survive, especially in the early days, in the wild, as hunter-gatherers. If we couldn't quickly make those kinds of distinctions, then we weren't going to make it very far. And so we have these minds that all they do is judge. They compare and contrast, right? Our mind is the repository for all that. And that constant talking, the voice that talks to you in your head, is part of your mind as well, doing all this comparing and separating and contrasting. Now, your body is a storehouse for your emotions. Emotions are somatic. It's the storehouse for your unconscious drives, those core beliefs we talk about, behavior patterns that we don't really know where they come from. 
This is Paul saying, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do, and I don't understand what a wretched man I am. It's this idea here that the body is storing all of that unconscious programming, whether it's childhood conditioning, memories, guilt, shame, all of that is there. And all of this is necessary for survival. That's why it's there. But if we leave it unchecked, which means if we stay unaware of the effect that our mind and our body, our thoughts and our emotions are having on us, then we remain in a kind of narcissistic bubble. And I know what you know what I'm talking about here. It's like when the emotion takes over and the train leaves the station and you're just on it, and you don't know why you're doing the things that you're doing, and sometimes you are thinking about things and they become your reality, and they're really not. Or if you're talking to someone who is laboring under the, the uh, idea that something is so heavy and that becomes their reality. I mean, literally, the reality we believe is a reality we endure. And so these things left unchecked, if we stay unaware, we stay inside that bubble. And that becomes our reality. And we act on that reality. And we act on others in that reality. So the people that we hurt, literally, as Jesus said, don't know what they're doing. We don't know what we're doing when we hurt people because we're inside this bubble. And it keeps us apart from others, and it keeps us apart from the reality of the moment. We won't see it. We only will see what we already are conditioned to believe. Now, in the West, here, in modern West, we're in love with our minds. We have this great love affair that's been going on for about 300 years since the Enlightenment, where rational thought and the mind is king and queen. It, it rules everything. And... You know, it works really well in physical systems. That's why everybody's getting westernized across the globe right now, because that kind of thought works really well in those instances. But in the last 50 years, more and more, especially in this country, we are falling in love with our body. We're falling in love with emotion. Emotions are what signal to others and to our culture that we are authentic. We are real people. We're in touch with ourselves. We have compassion. We have empathy. And emotion is taking over even rational thought. Take a look at our political discourse right now. Do you think that's rational? Of course not. Because emotion is trumping rational thought in our culture over these last few generations. Now, the ancient followers of Jesus understood all of this. And they understood that what we needed to do if we were really going to follow Jesus is to break our identification with our emotions, to break our identification with our thoughts. Those thoughts are not who we are. What we feel is not who we are. They're part of us. We need to pay attention to them, but we need to break our identification with them so that we can regulate our emotions. We can regulate our thought patterns. We can become unoffendable, which was the highest goal of the ancient church, believe it or not, to become unoffendable. We've made offense of virtue now, and we go the other way. But they were trying to make themselves unoffendable. They understood that the emotions, the positive emotions that one felt, they called them consolations. And they were a sign of actual immaturity. It's the honeymoon period that new converts and young people needed to be able to get through the difficulties of actually getting on the path of being able to start a new direction. But as you matured, all of that fell away. It was supposed to fall away, and you entered the desolations, where now the safety net is removed, for now that sense of presence or warmth or whatever it was you were feeling before in the consolations is removed. John of the Cross called it the dark night of the soul. He called it a dark ray of faith that was so pure that he couldn't even see it anymore. To persist through that, that descent and then the ascent on the other side, the Paschal mystery, everything that is repeated as a motif over and over throughout scripture is the shape of this journey. We don't appreciate that anymore as a culture, as a church. Everything is about consolations. Everything is about ascent up to our goal as we see it, the outcome we are looking for, rather than realize there is this interplay between the two. And our emotions are not who we are. Our thoughts are not who we are. We need to disconnect from them. We need to detach from them. Now, what we need to do with our emotions, we also need to do with our thoughts. We have to break our identification with them, with our mindset and with our worldview. Because the thoughts 
And the worldview is part of us, but it's not who we are. And it's not a reflection of reality, real reality. Now, as with emotions, the difficulty is that the sources of our thoughts are also unconscious. As we talked about, the emotions are unconscious. We can't control them. We can only control what we do when we have them. And the source of our thoughts are also unconscious. We don't know what we don't know, but there are assumptions down there that are driving the thought patterns. There are things that we were taught as children that have become core beliefs, things we deeply believe, but we're not aware of them. But they're driving the, the thought patterns and then the behavior patterns beyond that. So, as with emotions, the difficulty is that we're going to have to dig deeper. Now, we've talked about how various belief systems can disallow us from being able to follow Jesus' way. An example would be this legal contractual mindset that we were just talking about, that a relationship with God is basically contractual. If we can do everything that we're supposed to do legally, then God will do everything that he is supposed to do in terms of saving us and keeping us from harm, or however we have written the agreement in our own minds. But there are assumptions beneath that that drive these thoughts. And so here's going to be the thing. If we recognize that a thought or belief pattern that we have is dysfunctional, it doesn't take us where we want to go. And so we're ready to jettison that. All good. We're ready to sell that, give it to the poor, and, and follow Jesus. But then in the next thought, we're thinking, okay, what replaces it? If that one was wrong, what's the right one? And let me find the right one, and then I'll put that in, and then I'll be okay. If I can just find the right one, and then when that one proves to be wrong, then we're looking for the one after that. But there is the assumption underneath this that is our problem. In this rush to fill the vacuum of the last belief system that we have genesis with the next true one, you know, that works for social sciences really well. It works for train schedules really well. You know, it's either right or it's wrong. But for spiritual and existential issues, this assumption that there is a true thought that we can have that will accurately describe everything that we can't see is the problem. That's the problem. The thought is the byproduct of the problem. But we need to dig down deeper into the actual assumption because the belief that a thought that we can have, a belief system that we can have, is literally our savior. That's what saves us. The right idea, the orthodox idea, is what is going to earn us God's approval. That is the problem. It's what stops us dead in our tracks and keeps us forever separated from this moment, from God. This is literally what Jesus was saying in Matthew 7 when he said, we did all these great things in your name, Lord. And he said, but I never knew you. We never connected. Because you were still laboring under this other assumption that there had to be a right thing that you pursue as opposed to all the wrong things. All throughout human history, but especially I think in this day and age, we're fixated on answers. We need and want answers. We want to get the right answer to this mathematical or this legal question so that we can come up with a formula that equals salvation, equals not having to go through all the difficulties that we see around us in life. Man, if we could just know that secret, right? That secret. How many books do you see? How many ads do you see right now that are selling you the secret? The secret to this, the secret to that, from diets to selling stocks to whatever, there's a secret. And we all are just fixated on finding that secret because if we could find the secret, what are we saying? Life becomes risk-free, right? This thing becomes risk-free. We don't have to deal with uncertainty anymore. And it is our intolerance for uncertainty that's driving all of this, that we can't stand uncertainty. Our intolerance of uncertainty drives our need for answers, right answers, absolute answers. I remember reading Thomas Merton at one point, and he was talking about the Bible, a little teeny book called Opening the Bible. And he said, the first thing that you need to realize is that this book is unlike any other book that you will ever read. And when people approach the Bible, they're usually looking for answers. But as you get more deeply into the Bible, if you really let it work you, if you really see it as it is written, 
and not as we assume it to be, we realize that we're not moving through life from answer to answer. We're moving through life from question to more pertinent and incisive question. And it's this movement through the questions. It's the engagement in the questioning itself that is the way of Jesus. Because life is uncertain, and it's always going to be. And if you won't accept that, then your life is going to be very, very difficult. Spiritual matters are uncertain. We can't see them. Jesus says they're like the wind. We don't know where they're coming from. We don't know where they're going to. What's you going to do? They're uncertain. We can't ultimately understand them. Can't do it. It's not possible. But through this process of questioning, and more and more incisive questioning, deeper questioning, is the experience that's going to lead us to a conviction that is not the same as certainty, because you can't prove it. You can't transfer it to somebody else. But it works for you. Your conviction is as good as certainty to yourself when you have experienced the truth that Jesus talks about that makes you free of your fear of uncertainty. And Jesus knows all this. This is exactly how he works. And he's much more about questions than answers, always. And he's much more about questions as answers. Ask Jesus a question, what do you get, you know? Because he knows that the only way that we can approach the unseen truth that makes us free is this process right here. Have any idea how many times Jesus asked a question in the Gospels? You know, somebody actually counts these things. Can you believe that? Not me. Thank goodness I found it someplace. Jesus asks a question in the Gospels 307 times. He's always asking questions. Now, he is asked 183 questions. You know how many of those 183 questions he actually answered, gave a direct answer to the question? Exactly three. So literally, for every question that he gives a direct answer to, he asks a hundred questions. <laughs> He's all about the questions. And for Jesus, the questions are the answers. They don't satisfy us. It didn't satisfy them 2,000 years ago. How much less are they going to satisfy us in the modern age, right? But this is what's going on here. Jesus is all about questions. In fact, let me try to prove it to you just really quick. Let's go through a few a few uh, verses here. And let's see how Jesus works. Let's see how Jesus uses these questions to get us where he's trying to get us to go. Matthew 9, starting at verse 14. They're in your handouts, but I think John is putting them up on the board as well. John's disciples. So this is John the Baptist. John's disciples come to Jesus and ask him, how is it that we, John's disciples, and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not, your disciples do not fast? And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? Okay, now that's not particularly satisfying. <laughs> I mean, they're asking a very straightforward question here, and there's a lot, a lot of resentment behind it, isn't there? I mean, we are depriving ourselves. We're doing all this stuff, and you guys don't. You whatever you want, whenever you want. Jesus was called a drunkard and a glutton by some because he partied. You know, he was joyful. He was living an abundant life. Why do you guys get to do that and we don't? What is Jesus talking about here? We talked about this early in our little meditation during worship. John's disciples were waiting for something. They were waiting for the Mashiach. They were waiting for a very specific Mashiach, one who would come in temporal power, one who was going to be a warrior king who would throw out the Romans and reestablish Jewish sovereignty. They were waiting for that. And so they were fasting and praying. And, and all. What's the first thing Jesus says when he comes on the scene at Mark 1.15? The waiting is over. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. When the bridegroom is with you, when you're at the wedding reception, you're not going to be fasting. You better not be. He's trying to get them to completely change their mindset and their worldview. You don't need to be waiting anymore. That's not that fasting doesn't have great spiritual properties anytime, but in the way that you're doing it is not appropriate right now. The waiting is over. The kingdom is here. You need to see the larger picture, understand how your mindset, your assumptions, your way of asking this question and everything behind it is your blockage 
is why you won't ever be able to understand, experience what kingdom is all about. Matthew 15, starting in verse 1. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now you have to understand that there were 613 laws that the rabbis had extracted from the written Torah, the first five books of the Bible. But they added thousands of other unwritten oral traditions that they called fences around those 613 laws. So you had to break a bunch of the oral traditions before you actually could break a law, which was really bad, right? The trouble is, they got so invested in their tradition that the tradition became more important than the written law. And this is how Jesus answers them. Why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? And he launches into their practice of korban, which we don't need to go into right now. But understand here, they are all about legal compliance. They are all about following the code of not only what they found in their scriptures, but what they have added to it over the centuries. And Jesus is saying, it's about being present to the needs of the moment that dictate what we should choose and what we should do. And to be fully present and to see what love requires, that's everything. Complete change of worldview. John 11, starting at verse 8. Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Okay, so Jesus is Transjordan. He's over in the Perea. He, is, he ran out of Ju Judea and out of Jerusalem because they literally were picking up stones to, to kill him. And he's teaching over there. But when he gets word that his friend Lazarus is sick, after three more days of teaching, he decides he's going to go back. And his followers are like, what are you doing? It's too hot over there. You know, not only are you going to get killed, but we probably are too. A short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there. And Jesus answers, are there not 12 hours of daylight? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night... He stumbles because the light is not in him. Now imagine how that went over. <laughs> when they're worried about getting killed by the authorities in Jerusalem, and he's talking about 12 hours of daylight? Well, what in the world is going on here? You know, no one really knows what Jesus is talking about here. You know, everybody is confused, and there's a lot of different opinions. But if you put all the scholarly ideas together and said there was, if there's any kind of consensus that the 12 hours of daylight are Jesus' lifetime, it's his ministry, while he is here physically on the earth. And he needs to get everything done within that time. And furthermore, he's going to be protected in getting everything done during that time. And so will anyone who's with him. And that's the idea that they're, they're putting across. But as I read this, what I'm thinking is, getting back to presence, is that our presence to the light of the day, our presence to the light of this moment has everything it needs to inform us of the choices that we need to make, even if they're dissonant, even if they seem disadvantaged, disadvantaged, even if they seem risky. But not to be present to this moment, to be fully here to see what is needed, is like stumbling around in the night. And this is what Jesus was doing. He's an exercise in presence. He is so present to the people he's teaching while he's transjordan that even when he finds out his friend is dying, he stays three more days to continue to tend to them. But when he decides to leave, he's fully present to everyone he meets in that story of the raising of Lazarus, just as equally. I think he's talking about presence, to be present during this moment, the light of this moment, and let that inform your choices. At any rate, Another complete change, hitting the people right in the face because they're approaching him on one level and he's trying to get them on another. Luke 18, starting at verse 18, a certain ruler asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And what's going on here? Remember, this young ruler is coming to Jesus looking for another set of rules. He's followed the law his whole life. He's really good at it. He's done really well. But he realizes that there's something missing, and he knows he needs something more. So he goes to Jesus as the something more. Good master, give me another set of rules that I can follow, just like I follow the last set. That'll get me further down the road. And Jesus says, what are you looking at me for? 
You know, why are you calling me good? God in heaven is good. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get him to have his own experience, to connect directly with his Father in heaven, to have that unencumbered experience, to clear everything out that he needs in order to have that experience. That's the whole point. Again, 180 degree spin. Mark 12, verse 14, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, now we're getting into politics. I love it, yeah. Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Of course, they were trying to trip him up. Why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Because there's the first question. Then he says, bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. And then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. What is he doing here? He's taking a very specific question, a political question. And he's avoiding the politics, which I love, of course. But he always does this. He always not only avoids the politics, he, invo- he avoids the macro. He avoids having the mantle of power in any way put upon him because that's not what he's about. He's about the micro. He's about turning individual hearts on. But in this case, he's about taking a very specific question and expanding it to a huge principle for life. About accepting the things that we can't change and not using those things that we can't change as an excuse not to do what we can do in the moment. It's like when Mary comes to him and anoints him with oil and Judas is complaining that that money could have been given to the poor. And he says, you're always going to have the poor, but you're not always going to have me. Don't let your vision of this huge cause, this spectacular purpose out there someplace, keep you from what's right in front of you because this is what's at issue. This is what's important and this is what's right in front of you now. This is what defines you as a person right now. Not your aspirations for accomplishment someplace else. Right here, right now. Luke 10, verse 25. On another occasion, an expert of the law stood up to teach Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he asked him, what's written in the law? So he starts with the basics. He starts with the law because this is a lawyer he's talking to, right? And the lawyer replies, how do you read it? He says, how do you read it? What's written in the law? The lawyer answers, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. But he wants to justify himself. So he asks Jesus further, who is my neighbor? And he really thinks he's got Jesus here. And does Jesus answer the question? No. What does he do? He tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, he could have just simply said, everyone's your neighbor. Come on, dude. Now, how much would that have registered with him? But to tell a story of a Jew who gets mugged on the road to Jericho, and then a priest and a Levite in succession go by and just pass him, and a Samaritan comes and cares for him, and you've got to understand the Jews' idea of Samaritans at the time, their attitude toward them. If you think about blacks in the South in the 1950s, you're getting close to the way that they felt about Samaritans, the half-breeds, those who worship incorrectly, and so on and so forth. But it's the Samaritan that comes and helps, and then he asks the final question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And of course, he's forced to say it was the Samaritan. He doesn't call him a Samaritan. It's the one who bound his wounds. Okay, good answer. But now having engaged this story, engaged the process, how much more powerful is the punchline? How much more powerful is the the message that whoever is in your path is your neighbor, whether they're of your clan, your tribe, your nation or not, whether you like them or not? Matthew 18, right at verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he, what does he do? He calls a little child to him and place, plants, placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you can just picture this scene for a moment, it's going to be a bunch of men, of course, And in that patriarchal culture, treating women and children like property. And they're asking who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Think about their mindset. Think about what it is that they are picturing. And think about the political power that they're picturing it within, right? And he just quietly takes his time, goes over, brings his child, and stands his kid in front of him. I mean, it's just an amazing scene. 
What in the world is he doing? This is beneath him. This is beneath us. Unless you become like one of these? Damn. That answers the question in a way that they would never have expected, but not directly. Jesus loves to use some kind of model, some kind of metaphor, some kind of object lesson to try to get the point across. At John 8, verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, it's commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. Is that classic Jesus or what? Think about the charge scene that we're in right now. The yelling and the screaming and the anger and the insults and everything in the court of the temple. And Jesus just stoops down and starts doodling in the dust, just ignoring them. Imagine how that escalated the situation. And they persisted in asking him. So he straightens up and he says to them, he who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And he does this until every single one of them is deflated, drops the rocks, and leaves. And then he turns to the woman and says, Woman, where are your accusers? No one, Lord. I'll go and sin no more. Go and stop doing the thing that gets you in a separated situation like this. Go and stop doing the things that keep you from having the connections that life is all about. Once again, not a direct answer, but a challenge to the mindset that they had. And not only that, a challenge to the motives they had for doing what they were doing. And finally, John 1, verse 38. Turning around, Jesus saw some of these fishermen following him, and he asks, what do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he replied, come and see. That's got to be maddening after a point, right? I mean, a simple question, Lord. Where are you going? Remember where are you going at the Last Supper, Thomas? Jesus says, you know the way. Thomas says, I don't know the way. Where are you going? And what does he answer then? I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. This is Jesus engaging them, inviting them to an experience that will give them everything that they need to know, but not intellectually, not in a way that they can say this is the right thought and this is the wrong thought, but an experience that will convince them of a truth that will make them free of the fear of needing the answers in the first place, a conviction that's built in trust. This is Jesus trying to get us to step beyond the assumption that somehow we can intellectually know or understand the truth that has this power to make us free. It's the participation and the engagement the questioning process that will convince us of something that we'll never understand intellectually. I ran across a little story here, and I think maybe it's, it's, a, it's a modern story of, of an evangelist who was working with people. And listen to just what he says. He says, at times I've answered questions with biblically accurate, logically sound, watertight answers, only to see questioners shrug their shoulders. My answers, it seemed, only further confirmed their opinion that Christians are simpletons. So I started answering questions with questions. Once during a weekly Bible study for freshman guys that we held in a student's dorm room, the frequently asked question of exclusivity arose, more of an attack than a sincere inquiry. So I suppose you think that all those sincere followers of other religions are going to hell. Huh? And he asked, do you believe in hell? The questioner appeared as if he never sincerely or seriously considered the possibility. After a long silence, he said, no, I don't believe in hell. I think it's ridiculous. Echoing his words, I said, well, then why are you asking me such a ridiculous question? <laughs> yeah. Now, I wasn't trying to be a wise guy. Well, maybe not much. <laughs> I wanted him to honestly examine the assumptions behind his own question. The silence was broken by another questioner who chimed in. Well, I do believe in hell. Do you think everyone who disagrees with you is going there? I asked, do you think anyone goes there? Is Hitler in hell? Of course Hitler's in hell. Well, then how do you think God decides who goes to heaven and who goes to hell? Does he grade on a curve? From there, 
the discussion became civil for the first time. Breaking through the first bits of ice, getting to the place where now there could actually be a meeting of the minds and discuss some issues that might actually get us someplace. See, the answer was not about hell. The answer was not about proving one concept over another. The answer was in having a civil conversation. That was the answer to the question, about engaging in asking questions that can't be answered. We can't know about hell. How in the world are we going to know about hell? Really? Truthfully? It's unknowable. We can't know what's on the other side of this veil. And yet we fight and excommunicate and kill and do all these things over the stuff we can't know, when the things that we can know, we're stepping all over in order to get to these concepts that we're fighting about. Finding our connection with each other along the way is the answer. Being less intolerant, being less fearful of uncertainty, because we have each other along for the ride. And each other really are God's hands and feet and faces if we will let them be. So God is, Jesus is all about questions, 307 questions, answering only three out of 183. I suppose it would be unfair of me not to tell you what those three are. Does anybody want to know? The three that he actually answered? <laughs> First John 1837, Pilate, so you are a king then. Yes, I am a king. For this I was born. Luke 11, verse 1, Lord teaches how to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, pray in this way. And he gives them the Our Father. And finally, at Matthew 22, verse 36, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. This is the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Three questions. But notice this. These are questions that Jesus answered with questions or stories or object lessons someplace else. He's just kind of recapping here. He's in summary here. Because he knows that just the direct answer is not going to scratch the itch. The direct answer is really not what we're all about. We can't think our way into kingdom. It just doesn't work that way. Thinking separates us. Like we talked about, that's the way our minds work. All our minds do is separate things from this to that. That's how we survive. That's how we can make choices quickly that our survival depends on, right? This dualistic view that our minds create is the opposite of the unity of kingdom. This is why he said it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Why? Because the rich man has not just material possessions, but these ideas, this idea of, of identity, who he or she is. And that is what's keeping him or her from being able to get into kingdom. It's like trying to use our minds to get into kingdom is like bringing a knife to a gunfight or trying to get into orbit from an airplane, right? It just doesn't work. It's the wrong vehicle. It's a contradiction in terms. We can't do it because the more we think, the less we're able to just be connected in unity and in presence. Anything that we can intellectually know, the answers that we are so obsessively seeking, can only, and at best, show us the door, outline it for us, Tell us where it is. It's engaging the questions and questions after questions that actually takes us through. I was asked to um, write a personal epistemology. And uh, I mentioned this last week and said, I, I don't want to disappoint you because I know how much you've been waiting all week for this personal epistemology, right? Epistemology. What is that? It's a branch of, psycho uh, branch of psychology, branch of philosophy that has to do with the theory of knowledge, okay? How do we actually know what we know? What are the sources of knowledge? And, and what are the origin of knowledge? And, and what's the scope of knowledge? It's just all the study of knowledge itself. And so I finally, it took me a couple of weeks, but I, I did go ahead and, 
and write a little page and a half. I want to write you, read you just a, a portion of this because I think it's the best that I can do to try to put this final fine point on what we're talking about here because for us to try to step aside from our thinking is so difficult for us to do because we think the thinking is everything. The rational approach is everything, all right? Now, I'm limiting epistemology to what I can know and how I can know anything about spiritual or religious truth. So I'm just talking about what I can know and how I can know it. I've had to come to terms with a very different experience of spiritual formation. That it is really subtraction as opposed to addition. That we are born with everything we need to fulfill our human purpose. But the onset of self-awareness, the ability to think itself, along with the hurts and traumas starting in childhood, are what hide that everything from our conscious minds. In that vacuum of hidden self, our conscious minds become our identity and our window to reality as we understand it. We've eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and have died to the oneness of the garden we ex knew and experienced before. And now we know we're naked. Our human journey is to get back to the garden, but this time by the conscious choice of subtracting all blockage, all that is not the authentic self that has been in us all along, as if frozen in the, that block of ice. The problem is, the mind that we would use to process this subtraction, chipping away at the ice around our true selves, is the repository for all the blockage in the first place. So it is not to be trusted to do the job. It will use the filter of its worldview as a starting point, a self-referential point from which we cannot proceed. This is why Jesus and every responsible wisdom teacher is obsessed with breaking our identification with our minds and our minds stranglehold on what we see as real, what we see as true. The process of subtraction is how we can know what we know and begins with the deconstruction of our worldview and the very way we formulate worldview. This is the do not judge of Jesus, letting go of the stranglehold our minds have on us until we learn in some form of contemplation to step aside the constant thought stream of our egoic mind's consciousness and find a deeper level of being we are caught in a loop of thinking we know something just because we are thinking we know. Our ability to think is a byproduct of our self-awareness, a necessary tool for survival, but it's not who we are. As we get better at being aware without thinking about awareness and aware of our emotions in the same way, we become present in a way that was not possible before. And intellectual knowledge takes a different place in priority. We realize that what we can intellectually know about spiritual truth, since it doesn't play by the rules of physics or logic, is next to nothing. And so we have to learn to become content with uncertainty. Life is made of uncertainty. So wisdom teachers respond to logical questions with paradox knowing that when students can leave paradox unresolved, they are ready to move forward. All we think we know about spiritual truth is just a placeholder, an arbitrary paradigm. But if our paradigm allows us to do two things in life, accept life on life's terms, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, and live with a sense of hope and gratitude, then it is true at least true enough to allow us to live with the abundance of life that Jesus has as a goal for us. But even then, we're only one trauma away from losing that truth again as our ability to accept life and our sense of hope and gratitude is swept away in loss. Then we either retreat back to old beliefs or push further into more uncertainty to find a new paradigm that is true again an eternal becoming. Now, this is not to say that there's no absolute objective truth apart from our own subjectivity, but we'll only know that truth enough that it has the power to make us free of our fear of uncertainty 
as we live it through, not think it through. So the bottom line here, we must break our love affair with our minds if we really want to follow Jesus. It's not just what we think or believe we believe that is the problem. It's how we think. And what we think about our minds that keeps us off the path, keeps us anxious, keeps us afraid, keeps us chasing our tails. As long as we're holding to a rational approach to the spiritual truth, then we're missing the point that Jesus is making. If we try to stay in control, which is all rational thought is about, is staying in control because of our fear, it's only when we accept that we're naked in the garden, vulnerable and uncertain, that we can begin to slip into trust and trust for the first time. Trust is indistinguishable from faith. And so it's faith that actually takes us where we want to go. But as long as we're trying to control, as long as certainty is our goal and our highest good, then we're not even stepping into faith, which is the ability to act in the face of uncertainty, in the face of doubt. Now, this is a really hard step for us because it means, ultimately, that any theology that we adopt, no matter how beautiful, no matter how ancient, right, is just a placeholder. It's a paradigm that was never intended to accurately describe God, the Godhead, unseen spiritual life. What can't intellectually ever be understood, but it's actually a pointer, an encourager, a motivator that shows us the door and helps us to walk through. Now, before you pick up rocks, right, notice something. Jesus never gives us a theology. It's not what he's about. And even as he himself keeps the written law assiduously, always a good Jew to the end of his days, although he breaks the tradition of the Pharisees, but he is following the law always. He is consistently working to tear down the cultural and the religious worldview that is keeping the people from their God. It is separating and keeping the people from an actual experience of truth, the truth of a degreeless love, a love that has no degree. That's the good news. And until we get that, we get nothing. And Jesus is tearing that down consistently. We spend so much time with our theologies, with our orthodox beliefs, using that as the arbiter of what? Of separating ourselves one from another and going in the exact opposite direction that Jesus would have us go in kingdom. It's only by stripping away and selling everything that we finally get to the bottom of the dog pile with all our assumptions gone so that we can see what's really in front of us. With all our arrogance gone of thinking that we know and thinking that others don't the truth. And we finally, at the bottom of that dog pile, can find our humility, our vulnerability, and our connection to each and every other person in our path. And finally, in that place, naked, in the garden, we can finally celebrate our dependence. We can celebrate our uncertainty with a conviction that's based in trust. And then this abundant life that Jesus is talking about is ours. Even as we continue <laughs> to live from question to question as the ultimate answer to life. Let's pray. Father, sometimes we think that you could have made it easier for us. Sometimes we wish that things were more straightforward. We pray for certainty. We pray for you to show us the way. Help us to begin to see that even in praying that way, even as virtuous as it may seem for us to want the path to be so straightforward, that our ability to allow ourselves the dissonance, to allow ourselves the disturbance of the uncertainty, 
to live with questions that we can't answer, but to use them to find our connection with each other. Help us to see that that is the way that Jesus is showing us. Help us to, little by little, let go of more and more of what we assume to be true so that we can experience everything that you have for us. Help us to define our offenses, our resistances, and question them as well. Step aside from them and let them teach us more about what it is that needs to be sold and given away. But in everything, Lord, thank you for your love and your constancy, for being with us every step of the journey, even when we feel that you're not. And never let us forget, we can only love because you loved us first. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.